Hi guys, it's Crystal. I hope you guys are all doing well today. I hope you're enjoying the weather. Um, I've heard tomorrow the S word is supposed to come back. I'm not going to mention it because hopefully it won't. Um, but I hope you guys are all doing well and that you're having a really good week. Um, it is Easter weekend this weekend. So hopefully if you guys are celebrating it, you'll be safe and follow the protocols and everybody will be okay moving forward. Um, if you guys are new to my channel, like I said before, my name's Crystal. I do Canadian true crime or true crime with a Canadian twist. From time to time, I do talk about other nationalities. Um, sometimes people recommend them or just for a comparison to see how uh, crimes are different in different places. But for the most part, I, drew, I do Canadian true crime. So if that is something that sounds really great to you guys, hopefully you will like, like, like these videos. Hopefully you'll subscribe so you can join me every week hit the notification bell and leave me some comments if you guys do choose to leave some comments though no hate please no hate there's enough hate out in the world today and we're just here to talk about things and different theories my points of view might be different from yours and that's okay it's good to learn about different things and get a different perspective on things as well these videos are for entertainment or educational purposes only just so that we can make youtube happy and if you guys are returning subscribers, you guys already know how much I love you and how grateful I am that you guys invite me back into your home once a week, sometimes twice, um, so that we can talk about things. So thank you very much. So today, we're actually going to go back up to Nunavut. Um, this is a historical crime. So at the point in time when we were talking about it, it would have still been part of the Northwest Territories, but we're going to go by Nunavut standards because that's where it belongs today. So the area we're talking about is actually the Belcher Islands. And Nunavut itself is actually the largest province or territory in Canada. Um, it's, it's very large, guys, but it's very sparsely populated. It's the second least populated place in all of Canada. Aside from the Yukon, they're the least populated place. Um, however, statistically speaking, the homicide rate in Nunavut is very, very high. It's the highest rate in Canada. Now, Nunavut has a population of about 39,353 people, um, give or take, as of 2016. So the rate that I found was on statista.com. Um, that's usually what I use to get my rates. And it's 17.81. If you guys remember when we talked about Ontario, the rate was 1.66 per 100,000. This is 17.81 per 100,000. That seems astronomically huge. I know I tried to do some of the math myself and I was like, this does not make sense. It roughly works out to about seven or eight murders per year. But because it's so sparsely populated, it seems like a huge explosion in in homicides. It's not, it just has to do with the population itself. Um, Nunavut is actually, the Belcher Islands in Nunavut are actually most well known for their um, soapstone guys. Um, it's very much integral to the carving industry in Nunavut and the other parts of the territories. And in Nunavut itself, um, you are more likely to be murdered by a family member or a friend. That usually accounts for most of the homicides. And apparently the territories um, have three, it's, it's about three times more likely that you'll be murdered in one of the territories than in the provinces down below. I didn't know that. That's actually surprising to me. I always thought of the North as like a safer place to be, to be honest with you. Um, so that was a surprising statistic for me. Now today we're talking about the Belcher Islands and I got to give you a little bit of history guys, just so that you understand, um, it might seem like it doesn't make sense at the time at, at this point in time, but it will later on. Trust me. So the Belcher Islands are actually just little rib shaped islands. They're about 1500 and they're on an archipelago. So like I said, there's 1500 of them and they're they take up about 5000 kilometers square but only 3,000 kilometers square of that is actual land. There's not a lot of vegetation on there, guys. There's there's no trees really to stop the wind from blowing or anything. It's mostly just shrubs. And they're very much abundant in sea life. Um, they have seal and they have walrus and they have Arctic hair there, but there's no caribou, which is, um, and, and was at that point in time, one of the main ways that um, the indigenous population survived was off of caribou. However, in the Belchers, there is no caribou there. 
So before, prior to 1914, um, there wasn't much known about the Belchers. Uh, very few people had seen the Belcher Islands and the Belcher Island inhabitants really didn't know a lot about the outside world. The outside world didn't know a lot about them and vice versa. So in 1914, um, a map maker named George Weetowak uh, had made a map and it actually ended up in the hands of Robert Flaherty. Now, one of the islands on Belter Islands is named after Robert Flaherty. Um, but he was actually also the filmmaker that in 1922 produced Nanook of the North. I have actually seen it. I did take a film class. It's interesting, but contextually speaking, it was the way they viewed the native population then. Um, anyway, George had made this map. It ended up in the hands of uh, Robert Flaherty. And so from that point on, map, ma map makers were actually able to properly chart the Belcher Islands. Before then, they just drew them in in the general area they figured they were and put specs on there. This is just to provide an example of how little known the Belcher Islands were at this point in time. Um, now, the Belcher Islands themselves, um, like I said, had 1500 islands but only presently only 822 or 882 people live on them and actually the year we were talking about it was much 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 less um our story starts in the winter of 1940 to 41 um it was actually 1941 that our our story starts but that particular winter on the belcher islands was harsh even by arctic standards um for some reason that year, food was less plentiful. So the populace would have to move more in able to find more sources of food, specifically seal. Um, they also used the blubber, like you guys know, for their lamps that they had so they could have um, warmth and uh, light as well. So they needed the seal. Seal skin clothes, Okay, they were great in the summertime because they were waterproof and um, they weren't heavy, but you can't really make clothing out of seal skin for the winter. So <laughs> their clothes were also not that warm either this particular winter. They actually had to go out and get edder ducks and make parkas that way. They didn't have the caribou to supply them with the materials they needed for warmer clothes. So it was a very harsh environment that these groups lived in. And I'm calling them groups because at that point in time, there was only 150 people that resided in the Belchers in this winter of 1940 to 41. And they moved around in groups. Um, usually they were related by family members, although they would sometimes meet up with other groups. Um, they were wandering around to find food sources. Um, they usually had like one elected hunter, one hunter that was really um, good for them that would get the majority of the meat source. And this, this hunter is usually also the person that had contact with the outside world. Um, in the 1920s, Hudson's Bay did actually build an outpost there. So the Inuit population was able to trade with them. Like I said, they had their elected hunter that would go down and trade for guns, ammunition, and tobacco specifically. Um, and they would trade their furs for that with this, this outpost. Um, I think the outpost was on Flaherty Island but I'm not quite sure which island it actually was on. So these were wandering bands of, of people. At some point in time after 1914, but prior to the 1940s, an Anglican missionary, I'm pretty sure it was Anglican, that's what I read, an Anglican missionary came to the islands. It seems like it was only one person and of course, you guys know at this point in time, what we did to the indigenous population in Canada, the white people came over and decided that this land was their land. It didn't matter that indigenous people lived there and had their own traditions. That stuff didn't matter. It was the white man's land. We were going to either force the natives to assimilate or get rid of them. So we chose for the most part to force them to assimilate. And that means that they were stripped of their culture. It was cultural genocide, guys. We've discussed this before when we did the Jack family. Um, we stripped them of their culture, their religious practices, everything. The native population at that point in time did not believe in Christianity. It was a completely different practice. They were a nature-based 
religion that believed in multi-gods. They believed in more than one god. They had no idea about, they'd never heard really, or it, it didn't make a lot of sense to them that there was one sky god who told them to follow all these rules that he had written in a book. And if they didn't follow the rules, they would be sent to hell. This was not in their way of knowing. Their way of knowing was an oral based tradition where they passed on legends and stories to their children so that they could teach them lessons and life lessons. And they uh, did it through stories. Um, they also would carve on rock some of their more significant stories, but for the most part, it was an oral based tradition and that's how they did things. The Anglican missionary, it, it doesn't seem like he had much contact with the people at all, but he was very into wanting to force, he wanted to be the guy that said that he introduced Christianity to the population. So he left a Bible. It was either one single Bible or Bibles. That part also wasn't really specific, guys. It was kind of hard to find information on this um, because it, it's 80 years ago. So it was kind of hard. Um, but he left a Bible or Bibles that had been translated into Inuit. So someone would be able to read them and pass on the stories. And this way he could spread Christianity and he figured everybody would be happy about it. That's not the way it turned out. You can't force a religion on somebody and not explain it and not tell them what it means and not go through the Bible with them and and not make it make sense to them. You cannot do that. This guy literally just left the Bible and then he left. There was a man within the wandering communities um, that was able to read uh, the, the Inuit um, Bible. And so he read out the passages to the community. Now this particular community we were, ta we're talking about today had about 43 people in it. So he was able to read it to them and he took it very literally. So that means when he translated the information and the stories to everyone else, it was literal. For them, it meant that Jesus was going to come down from the sky and save them very soon. The end of the world was coming and he would be their salvation imminently. That's what was related to the people. It, it's sorry. It, I know, guys, it's kind of confusing. It is very hard for me to explain it in proper terms. I, I don't want to step on anybody, so I'm trying very hard. This is what was written. Um... The one man also said that because the natives on the islands, the indigenous people, were literal, that they took the meaning of all the parables and all the stories to be a literal meaning, a literal truth. There's not really evidence of this, though, because most of the people on the islands knew legends. So they weren't technically literal, but that that's just one of the stories that I read about this. So I'm trying to get the information and get it out to you in the best way I can. So like I said, the conditions in this particular winter were very bad, even for an Arctic winter, and the seal source was not plentiful. So they had to move around a lot more in order to find food. Um, but they were starving. Starvation was actually imminent at this point in time, and they didn't really have anything else to do um, at night in the winter other than to sit in their igloos and tell stories. So this actually worked out for them. This man would either, there was either a central meeting igloo that he would go to or he would go and visit the rest of the people and just relate the stories and they'd pass them on that way. Regardless of what happened, they took it as the literal truth that Jesus would be saving them. And in their minds, this made a lot of sense. This was actually really great because somebody was going to come and save them from starvation. They figured that that Jesus's arrival would mean that they would be plentiful again. There would be no starvation. And they also, to some extent, figured that because the white man followed this Bible and he seemed to have so many goods, he seemed to have um, more supplies than he would ever need, that if they followed the Bible to a T, they would also have more supplies at their hands. They would be able to get their hands on specifically more guns, guys, and they would be able to live a much better life and a happier life like what they viewed the white man as living. Um, they figured if they had more guns than their hunter, 
well, they could have more hunters in the tribe and it would be much easier to shoot seals and get more seals at once than having to har harpoon them, which would take longer and you can only use the, it takes a longer amount of time to harpoon something, get the harpoon out, everything else. So they figured if they followed the Bible to a T, then they would, they would be as plentiful as a white man. So I believe the date was either the 18th or the 19th of January. There was a man within this particular grouping whose name was Charlie Owerak, Owerak or Owerak, O-U-Y-E-R-A-C-K. So I'm going to call him just Charlie. And, and he's going to remind you of somebody, guys, because he reminded me of somebody. He was a very short man. Um, he was 27 at the time and he had two children at least, but he had very low stature within the group. Um, he wasn't a hunter. He wasn't knowledgeable about, um, the white man. He wasn't, um, he didn't have a lot of contact with the outside world. He didn't, as far as I know, he didn't have any contact with the outside world. He wasn't a nice gap, an, an ice navigator. He wasn't particularly useful to the group himself. Um, however, he thought of himself as an angacock, which is actually a shaman or a medicine man. He thought of himself as a healer of sorts. So this is what he portrayed to the community and he wanted higher status. This is why I said he reminded me of another Charlie we knew, Charles Manson. He wanted higher status within his particular grouping. He wanted respect. There was a meteor shower, and it's either the 18th or 19th of January. I wasn't able to quite ascertain that date, but there was a giant meteor shower that occurred that night, and Charlie decided he was going to seize his opportunity. In his mind, he connected the meteor shower with a passage from Matthew within the Bible. It was only the New Testament as well, guys. I don't think I made that clear. It was only the New Testament that was given to the natives, as far as I know, it was not the Old Testament. It was just the stories about Jesus. So in his mind, he was able to connect this meteor shower with a passage from Matthew that basically said the falling stars would be the first sign of the arrival of Jesus. I think I have the actual quote. Just give me one second, guys. Meteor shower. Yes, quote, the stars will fall from the sky and you will see the son of man coming, quote. So in his mind, he was able to connect that with the end of the world. And this is where things turn bad for everybody. He turned to the people and said, quote, I am the Inuit Jesus Christ preparing the people for when the other Jesus comes, end quote. And in the native community's minds, probably because he considered himself a shaman, a healer of sorts. This made sense as well. They saw these falling stars. The meteorites look like falling stars to them. They saw these stars. They heard the passage as well. They were able to connect it together and they were like, oh my God, the end is coming. This makes sense. So he proclaimed himself the Inuit Jesus. Not only that, but there was also another man within the tribe. His name was Peter Sala. Uh, Peter was 34 years old. He did have a wife. He did have children. I'm not sure how many. It was a few at this point in time, but he was actually the best hunter in that particular grouping. And from what I read on all the islands, he was also the best ice navigator. And he was the one that did all of the trading with the Hudson's Bay Company. So he was the most knowledgeable within the group of the outside world. To them, he was the smartest, almost like their lead, almost like a leader of sorts. And he was also a very tall man. So not only did Charlie Auerach say that he was the Inuit Jesus, but he said that Peter Sala was God. To everybody, this made the most sense. It made sense even to Peter himself. Now, Peter is a bit of a mystery, guys. He has been described as a very rational man, very pragmatic. Um, he needed to see it to make sure it existed. He was very knowledgeable. He was actually a very smart man. Um, so it didn't make a lot of sense to people later on how he got swept up in this, but he did. Regardless, he got swept up in the fervor and he was like, yep, I'm God. So it made sense to everybody because he was so knowledgeable, because he was 
a leader of sorts because he was the best hunter because he, it he it made sense that he was god so the two of them started to weave together a tale for all of the people who were breathless and waiting with anticipation that Jesus was coming down in a kayak from the sky. He was going to come down. He was going to save them all from starvation. They were going to live a very fruitful, profitable life, just like the white man. They were going to have everything at their disposal. They wouldn't have to work hard for anything. They'd be able to fly. And they would just live this glorious life. The people were excited about this. You have to remember, very harsh conditions, very cold, limited food. They were starving at this point in time too, so that does something to you. Very limited resources. So this sounded like an absolute answer to their problem. This, they were, they were giving, um, Peter and Charlie were giving them the answer to their, their main problem of, star of starvation. In fact, the guy that read them the Bible stories was actually giving them the answer, or so they thought, to their main problem, which was food and getting food. So <clears throat> they weaved this story and everybody was in on it. They were like, yeah, this sounds great. So their first proclamation, both Charlie and Peter, their first proclamation was that everybody had to kill all the sled dogs within the community. Um, I shouldn't say all the sled dogs. I should say most of the sled dogs. Um, they convinced the people to do this because they weren't going to need the sled dogs in the coming future anymore. They'd be able to get around by flying. They would be able to fly to get from place to place. This is how they convinced the people. So their first proclamation was done. Um, they got rid of most of the sled dogs. It wasn't all, but it was most of the sled dogs. But this also served another purpose for Charlie because non-believers could now not escape. No one could leave the particular community. It would be very hard to walk and walk and walk and walk and walk, especially in these conditions. It, it would be hard to get around without a sled dog. So this, this served a purpose for Charlie as well. Maybe it was unintentional, but it served a purpose. And everything was okay for a week, an actual week until January 26th of 1941. There was a girl and her name was Sarah Apowcock. Um, I hope I'm saying these names right, guys. I mean, no disrespect. I hope I'm saying them right. And Sarah was either 13 or 15. Um, the sources I had said her age was, was both of them. So it'd be somewhere between the ages of 13 and 15. They were preaching at this one point in time, um, Charlie and Peter. Sarah stood up, turned and looked at them and told Charlie he was not the Inuit Jesus and told Peter he was not God, that the second coming had not happened yet. It was not imminent. And, and this was all basically a farce. Well, Charlie could not have this. Um, her half brother was a guy named Alec Apowcock. And he was one of the most fervent believers of all in what Charlie was saying. And he couldn't have this either. So he literally grabbed his sister by her hair and he hit her over the head with a really uh, big stick. This is the type of stick that they would use to beat snow off of parkas. And she fell to the ground. Um, and at that point in time, Charlie said she was Satan. Yes, I know. This reminded me a lot of the Salem witch trials too. You're a witch. You're a witch. Well, he proclaimed her Satan. So they held her up to a lit lamp from... Some people described it as a Putnam stove. I tried to look up what this was. This was not anything. From what I know, it was a killick, which is basically one of the lamps um, that they use blubber fat for. We described this before. It, it seems to be made of soapstone. The blubber fat lays on there. You have to trim the wick all the time to make sure it doesn't smoke. And this was the source of uh, light and heat. So they held their, her face up to it so that people could decide if she was good or evil. And somebody in the tribe was like, nope, she's evil, gotta go. So her brother hit her again. And at this point in time, she was knocked unconscious. He dragged her outside and there was a girl named Akinik and she was waiting there. Um, Akinik would be about 17 years old and she beat Sarah to death with the butt of a rifle. And that was how they got rid of that problem. Now, there were some non-believers within the group and they saw this and started to get a little afraid. A couple days later, I'm not quite sure when, there was another man. He was 47 and his name was... Uh, just give me one second, guys. I just want to make sure I'm pronouncing it right. K 
Kitoiak. His name was Kitoiak. And like I said, he was 47. So he was actually one of the, the more elder members of the tribe. He looked at what was happening and what had happened. And he said, you've got to stop all this preaching about God and Jesus. Um, he said this ostensibly because he didn't want to see anybody else within the community hurt. You know, the death of the sled dogs, the death of Sarah. This was too much for Kitawiak. Kitawiak, sorry guys. It, it didn't make sense to him. So what happened was, of course, Charlie turned and looked at him and said he was a devil. Um, Kitawiak did scuffle with the group for a little bit, but he was able to break away and escape to his igloo. At some point in time during the night, Peter, Charlie, and another ma man named Adlaycock went to his igloo and they started taunting him from outside the igloo. Now there are windows built into the igloo as well. And Peter actually took his har harpoon and threw it through the window and hit Kito uh, Weak. He hit him. And Adlaycock then took a rifle and fired two bullets in through the window and, and ostensibly killed Kitawiak. Okay, he is no more. And they went back at this particular time. And of course, the rest of the community found out. Now the community, the non-believers at this point in time were panicking. They decided not to say anything and just to, just to go along with everything. We've heard about this in other cults too. You know, they did it in Jonestown. Charles Manson did it. Um, even when we were talking about Rock Terrio, Non-believers kept their mouths shut so that that way they would not be hurt. They kept their opinions to themselves. It was better to follow the rules than end up dead. And actually, after the end of Sarah, um, they said, uh, quote, everyone was pleased. They all said, let us, be fa let us be thankful that Satan is gone, end quote. So they weren't unhappy that these murders had taken place. And this was just a week after the cult started. I just want to remind you guys, a week after the cult started, they already started with this. So everything was okay for the next couple weeks. At some point in time, they banded together with another tribe. Um, I'm not quite sure if, if 43 was the population before or if it was after they banded with the tribe, guys. It, it, it didn't, there weren't a lot of clarification uh, there wasn't a lot of clarification on that. But at some point in time, they found another band and they banded together with them. And this consisted of a 42-year-old man named Quarak, um, his 26-year-old son-in-law named Alec um, Ekluk, and some women and children. So it wasn't a huge band and they banded together. And of course, Peter and Charlie had to tell everybody what was going on and this was how everybody was going to be saved because they were hunting or they were, they were starving too. So they were like, this sounds like a great deal. Let us join up. All except Alec Ekpuk. He did not believe in this. This did not make sense to him. Now his father-in-law, Quarak, was actually the best hunter in this group. He was also a very good hunter too. Probably not as good as Peter, but a very good hunter as well. On the night of February 9th, 1941, Alec and Charlie got into an argument. Um, as Alec was turning to walk away, Charlie looked over at his father-in-law, Quarak, and said, you know what? He's a devil. You got to shoot him. So Quarak then loaded his rifle and shot his son-in-law Alec in the back and killed him as well. So we're up to three murders, guys, and it it the cult hasn't even been functioning for a month. This is a very short-lived cult, guys. Very short-lived. So about three weeks after this, a man named Ernest Riddell, and I, I feel like they'd had um, dealings with him before. Um, a man named Ernest Riddell came up to Peter Sala and wanted to hire him as a guide so that he could do some routine business um, from, from the outpost in, in the Belchers, it would sound like. Um, he wanted him to take him to the Great White River, which is in Quebec. It's, it's like on the coast, the coast of Quebec and there's a, there's a larger Hudson's Bay outpost there. He wanted to do business there. Uh, I believe he had actually hired, um, 
Peter before um, as a guide to go there because like I said he was the best ice navigator as well he wanted him he wanted Peter to take him to the outpost in Quebec so obviously there had to have at least been one sled dog left that's why I said they weren't all the sled dogs so Peter agreed and as they were going to Great White River it dawned on Peter that he had made a huge mistake it came upon him that he was not God and he was filled with remorse for what had gone on. He could not wrap his head around what he had done and what he had been a part of. So when they got to Great White River, he told a man that was pretty well known to the Inuit. He was a Métis man and his name was Harold, just give me one second guys, Ungartner. So, like I said, he was fairly well known to the Inuit population. Um, they'd had dealings with him before. And Peter Sala trusted Harold Ungartner. Um, so, he told him of the murders that had taken place up there. Um, at this point in time, Harold then relayed the information to Ernest Riddell. Um, her, Ernest Riddell then relayed it, yeah, I know, a lot of relaying, down to the Hudson's Bay headquarters in Winnipeg, and the Hudson's Bay headquarters then told the RCMP what had gone on in Ottawa. I don't think Peter was, like, upset about this. I think he just, he wanted justice at this point in time, as far as I know. He, he was not, he didn't try to keep anything secret. He let everybody know exactly what had happened. So immediately after all of the information was conveyed, both Riddell and Peter returned to the Belcher Islands. And they came upon another scene of horror. While Peter had been gone, his 25-year-old sister Mina, this would be sometime in early March as well. So literally a month and a half to almost two months his sister, his 25-year-old sister, Mina, she's been described as quite unbalanced. Um, she was also stout and physically very strong. She came out one night and told the, told the residents it was the end. The end had come. It was time to go meet Jesus. Jesus was coming down in his kayak tonight. They had to be ready for him now. Um, it was almost like she was the voice. I don't know what Charlie was doing at this point in time, but it was almost like she was the voice of God now. So she herded up as many people as she could. And from what, like she ran around the igloos yelling and screaming. From what I heard, she um, was using like a, like the kind of crop you use with sled dogs. And, and that's going to hurt a whole lot if it hits you. So she rounded up some people and herded them onto the sea ice. It was about 20 below zero at this point in time, guys. And she told them all they had to strip down naked. She was able to get at least 12 people, and they were all women and children exclusively, to go out there, guys. So she got them to take off all their clothes. She kept her parka on, but everybody else had to take off their clothes. She even went so far as to be ripping at the parkas and the pants of the little kids and she told them the end was coming the end was coming and for a few minutes they did what she was told but then it suddenly dawned on the mothers they came to their senses and they're like oh no this is not good they ordered their kids to get dressed and she's still trying to tell them to stay there and everything else um some of the kids were able to get dressed some of them weren't it was minus 20 degrees at night guys in the arctic in early march so frostbite hypothermia, all of that set in very, very fast. Some of the mothers were able to save their children. Some people were not able to be saved at all. And six people died of exposure that night. And when I say exposure, their bodies were pretty bloody, guys, because they things would start ripping open, the bottoms of their feet, everything else. So she basically sentenced these six people to death. Among the dead were Mina and Peter's 55-year-old mother, Mina and Peter's 32-year-old sister, a young boy named Moses, who was 13, Peter's nine-year-old son, Alec, a seven-year-old boy named Johnny, and a six-year-old boy named Jonasy. They were all the dead. So all exclusively women and children. And, and it was Peter's actual family that had died as well, as well as Mina's actual family, but like I said, quite unbalanced. So I, I don't even know if she fully, completely understood. 
Um, they got back and they were able to see what had happened. And of course, Peter was beside himself with grief, not only because his family members were dead, but because he figured if he had been there, he would have been able to stop any further massacre. In fact, he blamed himself for many, many years because he, in his own mind and to himself, he, he thought because he was the most knowledgeable, he should have known better than to buy into all this and get swept up in it. He could have stopped it, but he was obviously at this point in time unable to. He had no idea what his sister was doing, and he didn't speak to his sister for many, many years after that. So the RCMP was having a really hard time getting a plane to go there. They were in Ottawa, guys, and this was all the way up in the Belchers. It was wartime. So basically all the planes had been sent over to Europe to help with the war efforts. So it wasn't until it seems to me that it would be about the 9th of April. I'm pretty sure it was the 9th of April. Just give me one second, guys. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Alec was eight years old. Alec was eight, not nine. Oh, it was April 6th. So on April 6th of 1941, the RCMP were finally able to find some type of plane that would be able to take them um, up to investigate what had happened. Um, at this point in time, they also had two reporters and a coroner that went with them just so they could assess what had gone on. So they arrived on the Belcher Islands and they did about a two day tour um, just to see the bodies. They were still, they were able to see the bodies, of course, they're frozen, um, to see the bodies, to interview survivors and witnesses, and just to gather more information about what exactly had gone on. At this particular point in time, they took Quarak, Adlaycock, and Mina back down with them to Moose Factory. Now, Moose Factory is in James Bay. So it's um, it's in Ontario, but in the upper portion of Ontario. And that's where they took those three. And this was super exciting to those three. They'd never been off the island before. They'd never had any contact with the outside world. So like a plane ride was mind blowing to them. But it was also mind blowing to them that they were gonna get three hot meals a day. This sounded like a good deal to them. And nobody, not a single person out of the community ever tried to hide what they did. They were very forthcoming with their information and they were very matter of fact. Well, this guy told us to do it. He said that these guys were evil and that Jesus wouldn't want evil people around. So we did what they told us to do because they were very much convinced that this was the truth. So Peter's wife was also asked, this makes me really sad. She was asked how she could abandon one of her children. And she actually had to describe the conditions to the investigators at that time. She was carrying a baby in her arms and, and a couple of her other children. I'm, I'm not sure how many children they had. And, and trying to get them off the ice and her feet were frozen solid, guys. Remember, they were forced to strip naked. So hypothermia and frostbite was already starting to take effect. She was able to get eight-year-old Alex's pants back on, but she wasn't able to get him off the ice in time to stop him from freezing. She was basically, she had to make a choice and it was a choice no mother should be able to make or should be forced to make, but she had to get the others in and then she tried to go back for him and it just, other mothers had tried to do this as well and it just, they were unable to. The kids were so small that they froze super fast. So no one, oh, also I do want to um, let it be known that no one ever tried to escape either. Well, they really couldn't because there wasn't a lot of sled dogs, but nobody tried to escape from the RCMP either. So Ottawa decided to hold the trials not in Ottawa, but in the Belcher Islands. They did this as a way to show Canadian justice, aka white Canadian justice, to the Inuits. Um, I guess they thought that this would be a way to deter further crime in Inuit communities if they, if they saw how Canadian justice was done. 
But once again, this is a completely foreign notion to them, guys. Their way of justice was completely different. They didn't have trials. If you were, if you did something bad and you were sentenced to death, you were, you, they killed you. And they didn't think anything of that. That was, that was the way that they, that they traditionally took care of things. They didn't have trials or anything. So this would also be all new to everybody. Um, the trial started in an RCMP trial, like it tent resurrected in the Belcher Islands. It was, uh, it started on August 19th of 1941. So it was headed by Justice C.P. Plaxton, and he was actually an Ontario Supreme Court justice. So he was going to be the judge for it. Um, the Crown and the prosecution were also from Ottawa, or were also from Ontario. And um, I'm sorry, I said that two reporters came along um, with the RCMP, at that point in time, but they didn't. It was later on. The reporters came up with um, came up with the RCMP. Two reporters did. Um, Riddell was there himself, and um, I think they had one other guy. Oh, and the coroner. They were all up there. So they had to have a six man jury. This was also very hard to find. So actually, the two reporters and um, Ernest Riddell became part of the jury, as well as three men from like a geological survey that had just happened to come upon the islands. They had just happened to come like in the in the previous couple days. So they were also recruited to be part of the jury. And this must have been some kind of site to the indigenous population to see men with wigs and robes and stuff. They, they'd never seen this before. And it's also interesting to note that when they brought uh, Adlai Cock, Quarak and Mina back from um, Moose Factory, they carried the flu back with them. It was something that was also foreign to the, uh, to the Belcher Islands at this point in time. They actually carried the flu back with them as well. So Alec Apicock, um, who was the guy, the the brother of Sarah, and Akinik were jointly um, tried for murder, the murder of Sarah. They were jointly charged with the murder of Sarah. Um, Peter, Adlai Cock, uh, Peter and Adlai Cock were jointly charged with the murder of Ki, oh man, Kitoiak. Sorry guys, Kitoiak. Um, they were they were jointly charged with his murder. Charlie and Quarak were each charged with the murder of Alec Ekluck, or Ekpuck. And Mina was charged with just the murder of six-year-old um, Johansi. Um, it seems like this was to be... Um, um, the six-year-old's murder was to be symbolic of all the people that had died in the... the that had died on the ice. Um, so they just charged her with one. However, Mina was deemed unfit to, strand, to stand trial. They had deemed her insane. So, um, like I said before, no one ever denied what they did. No one tried to get out of it. No one tried to escape. Nothing like that occurred at all. Um, they really did believe that Charlie was the Inuit Jesus and that Peter was God and that these people were evil and bad and Satan. So they killed them to, to get rid of Satan. And they said, quote, he said that Jesus was going to come soon and that he didn't want to see any bad people, end quote. So that's why they did what they did. So the prosecutor actually in this case argued against death. You know that you know, prior to, I believe it was 1969, prior to 1969, the death penalty existed in Canada. And at this point in time, a lot of people were hung. Um, remember Stephen Truscott, he was supposed to be hung for his crime. We'll, we'll talk about that at another point in time. I don't want to go off on a tangent about that. But hanging was very much a thing. However, the prosecutor argued against it. He said that a misuse or a misrepresentation of the knowledge within the Bible um, a misunderstanding, sorry, of the knowledge that, of, of religious knowledge, coupled with the harsh living environment, um, led to the massacre, and that hanging the offenders would not be in any way a deterrent to the, 
Inuit community at large, the, the, the Inuit community in other places. It just, white man's justice wouldn't, wouldn't be a deterrent at this point in time because it was a misunderstanding of the Bible coupled with starvation and harsh conditions. It, it just didn't make sense to try to hang these people. These people just, they weren't given a proper explanation of the Bible and also they were starving. So to try to hang people for what had happened just wouldn't make sense. Um, he also said that white Canadian justice couldn't be properly applied in the Belchers um, because of these um, factors. It, they, it just couldn't be properly done. It was a very different community than um, the lower provinces. It was, it, it was very different. And like I said, they didn't have contact with the outside world. So it's really hard to try to apply justice to people who had never seen it before. Not that they didn't do that in the other provinces. Um, it was just... It would seem that the prosecutor and even the judge had a little bit more compassion than what we've seen prior. Um, even the judge said the remote list wasn't really conducive, quote, conducive to excessive gentleness, end quote. So Alec Apocuck was acquitted. He was actually acquitted for these murders. And Akinik was... Um, found not guilty because of temporary insanity. They said she was temporarily insane at the time she did this. Um, Mina, of course, was already judged to be insane and unfit for trial, so she didn't stand trial for this. Peter, Adlai Cock, and Charlie, Peter, Adlai Cock, Charlie, and Quarak were all found guilty of manslaughter. It was just manslaughter because obviously... Prior to to what had happened, there had never been an intent to kill anybody. And it, it just was that night when they had picked the um, the fights, I guess, by standing up and saying that, that this was not right, particularly with Sarah and Alec, but also with um, Kitoiak. Um, it wasn't intended until that point in time. They were all found guilty of manslaughter. So Peter and Charlie, being the leaders, got two years hard labor. Just two years hard labor, guys. and um, Which would be done in Moose Factory. So they're not technically held at a jail cell. They were just held at the RCMP compound. And they'd work doing whatever the RCMP told them to. Um, Adlai Cop got one year. So he would have to do the same thing, hard labor. Um, but Mina and Akinek were to be held in custody for an indefinite period of time. I, I don't know why. That's just what was said. Um, they were, all five of them were loaded onto a boat or all six of them were loaded onto a boat and taken to Moose Factory where they lived and worked off their sentence. Uh, Quarak was actually allowed to stay in the Belcher Islands. His punishment was quite different than the others. Um, he was told that he had to supply a year round food source, a year-round supply of meat to all the families of the people that had been exiled. So that was his job. That's what he had to do. That was his punishment. Charlie actually died of TB in May of 1942. And by the fall of 1942, the rest of them, so Mina, who miraculously was back to her old self, Mina, Akinek, um, Peter, and Adlai Cock were all released from, from their sentences. They were all released, but they were not allowed to go back to the Belcher Islands for the rest of their lives. They were not allowed to go back to the Belchers. Um, of all the culprits though, and, and they were very honest. They were all very honest guys. It, it didn't occur to them to lie. This was actually what happened. So they all told the truth. Um, of all the culprits though, Peter was the most remorseful. And like I said previously, he held on to this for the rest of his life. This was just absolutely devastating for him. Not only the fact that he lost his family, but that he got swept up in this and allowed this to occur. Um, he did actually return to the Belcher Islands at the end of his life, but he lived the rest of his, his time on earth as a very shunned man. Nobody would talk to him within the communities. 
Um, all of this information was actually made public and I believe it was in the 2000s, guys. So all of the transcripts from the court uh, trial, all of the notes on the interviews, all of the notes on the massacre itself was actually made public. A lot of the information that I took was from um, the compilation of it. Um, but there was also a book written about the massacre. Um, it's called The End of the World, and it's by Lawrence Millman. And, uh, you know, it does describe the massacre. He was actually able to interview the survivors from it um, in 2001. And a couple years after that, he went to the Belcher Islands then, and he was, actually, he was able to interview the survivors. However, everybody at this point in time has since passed. Um, it was 80 years ago, so everybody involved is dead now. But he was able to interview them then. I think the book was released in 19, or in, sorry, in 2014, I think. However, the book is also difficult to read because it does talk a lot about technologies. It compares what happened then and how they were separated from the natural world by being forced into Christianity to how we're separated from the national uh, from the natural world by our consumption of technology it compares to the two of them so it's probably an interesting read um it's out there if you guys do want to know more and that's it guys that's the belcher island massacre that is what happened it was a very short-lived cult i have to say it's probably the shortest lived cult i've ever heard of but very deadly for the time they were actually in existence uh what do you guys think do you guys think that the introduction of Christianity, um, without being properly explained, was the reason why this happened? Uh, I'm going to say yes. Uh, I don't think anybody should be forced into a religion that they don't know, that they don't understand, and that they didn't pick or choose for themselves. I, I really think that that is absolutely destructive, and that's absolutely what happened here. We know it happened. Um this was not just something that happened in the Belcher Islands, guys. Uh, the massacre was. But um, the indigenous population being forced into Christianity and the fervent nature of people wanting to save people that they described in very derogatory terms. I don't want to use the terms because it's, it's just they're derogatory and they're terrible terms. But do you guys think that the introduction of Christianity started the whole ball rolling? What do you guys make of Charlie himself? Do you think that he was just a man that was out for power and control? Or do you think he actually believed this, um, that he was the Inuit Jesus? I, from what I can gather from my readings, he does seem like a man that was looking for status within the community. And this was the best way to do so. And that he let that power get to his head. And that's why so many people died. He did not want people to say anything against him. So therefore he denounced them as the devil or as Satan. And he was able to get people to do what he wanted them to do. He seems like he must've been a charismatic man, guys. Like I said, he was a little guy, big dreams, big aspirations. He reminds me a lot of Charles Manson. Um, even though Charles Manson kind of was insidious in the way he did it, he... He was a lot more like Rock Terrio, where he was just introducing and introducing slowly all these concepts. Charlie introduced them right then, and, and he was able to control this cult very, very fast. And he was able to put his ideas into play very fast as well. What do you guys make of Peter? Um, though he took part, particularly in the murder of Kitoiak, though he took part in it he did have a lot of remorse and he was horrified by what Mina did he did come to his sen his senses I don't know what to make of him he's very mysterious um what he did was absolutely unforgivable and he was not forgiven the people did shun him but at the same point in time he seemed to be very pragmatic and he seemed to be filled with a lot of remorse so he seems to be the more tragic character other than the poor people who suffered, but of the, I guess, of the, of the perpetrators, he seemed to be the more tragic of them. What do you guys make of Mina? Do you think she was actually quite imbalanced or do you think she actually enjoyed doing this? What do you guys make of that? Um, 
what do you guys make of the fact that it only took about two months for this whole entire concept to implode on people? What do you guys make of the fact that this was a very short-lived cult? What do you guys make of this story in general? Um, what do you? What are your thoughts on the Belcher Island Massacre? Is there anything that you guys can add to it? I think this is a very interesting story. It was more mind-blowing to me than I originally thought it would be, but that is the story of the Belcher Island Massacres, guys. So leave me some comments down below tell me what you think about how fast acting this try this this <laughs> this religion was this cult was cults have been existed have been in existence for a very long time but the fact that this could spring up in a place that was so underpopulated and that had such limited contact with the outside world that's also very surprising it shouldn't be i mean i'm sure it, ha it i mean it does happen all the time but it's just at that point in time, it was so sparsely populated and so, so unknown to most people. If only, if only the missionary had tried to explain any part of the Bible. What do you guys think of that? Do you think if the missionary had actually stayed and explained the Bible to them, actually talked to religion with the indigenous people, do you think this would have happened? Or do you think Charlie would have still tried to seize power? That's a good question. Okay, guys, I'm just going to leave you with a picture. I know there was one. Um, there there aren't very many, guys, obviously. Not a lot of photographs at this time. Sorry, guys. It's taking a few minutes to load. Um, and I'd also like to thank Lola today. She just slept throughout this. So, very... She wasn't barking as much as she was in the last video. <laughs> Apologies for that last video. Holy. Okay. Uh, I guess, guys, that... Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is one of the best pictures I could find. The tallest man that's in there is actually uh, Peter Sala. I'm going to just see if... Yeah, that would be the best known picture. Um, they don't really have much of anything else, but if you guys do just want to have a little picture of what the landscape looked like, you can clearly see there's not a lot of trees or anything else. Um, but that's part of what the landscape looked like at the time. So let me know down below, guys, your thoughts on this. It, it was a very amazing case. Um, next week, I have a case out of Medicine Hat that I want to talk about. You guys have probably heard about it before. Um, with regards to the case, I am going to have to use initials. Um, you can find the people's names on the internet. I did, so I know the actual people's names. And it has been talked about by other YouTubers, but because we're in Canada, I gotta have the accordance of Canadian laws. I gotta take that into account. And then probably a couple weeks from now, we are going to do a very, very well-known set of murders. Um, it will be at least three parts. I think you guys know who I'm talking about. I've learned some further information, so hopefully that'll go well. But hopefully you guys have a really good Easter weekend and have a great next week. And I hope to see you back here next week, guys. Bye for now.